Nahoo! The Banjo-Kazooie games star the titular heroes Banjo the Bear and Kazooie the Bird. The Banjo-Kazooie series had two entries on the Nintendo 64, which would later be re-released on the Xbox 360. These two games, Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie, feature similar gameplay and are considered the two main games of the franchise. Grant Kirkhope composed music for both games. A chunk of the music that he used for the first game was actually written for a different game project, Dream, which, after a long series of changes, eventually became Banjo-Kazooie. Banjo and Kazooie live in Spiral Mountain, along with Banjo's sister Tootie, and this location serves as a starting point in the games. Spiral Mountain also serves as the main residence of Gruntilda, or Grunty, the main antagonist of the series. Spiral Mountain is found in both Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie, and both of these games utilize the same melodic material for the area's music, but in vastly different ways and in different variations. I'll begin by analyzing the main version of the Spiral Mountain theme from Banjo-Kazooie, and then we'll compare the Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie versions of the music. Kirkhope arranged the music for the Banjo-Kazooie games so that each major character was represented by a particular musical instrument. For example, Banjo is represented by the banjo, Kazooie by the kazoo, and Tootie by the flute. Makes sense. The music in Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie was implemented so that certain elements of the musical arrangements would change depending on where the player ventured off to in a particular area. So for example, in Banjo-Kazooie, we have the main Spiral Mountain theme that plays when the player is on land, and a stripped-down alternate arrangement when the player is underwater. Let's break these two down first. The land version begins with a short introduction, which presents the banjo as the primary melodic instrument, as well as the rhythmic structure of the preceding material. Putting this piece in 4-4, you always hear something on each 8th note pulse, and the 16th neighboring tones are a signature part of the track. If you don't know what a neighbor tone is, it's basically a note that's a step up from the previous note and the next note, which adds a little spice instead of just repeating the same note over and over again. You can also hear the three low notes, which lead us to the beginning of the melody. This will also be heard throughout. This intro is short, sweet, and effective in getting us ready for what's to come. From here we get into the meat of the piece. The two bars here introduce the main material that will be played with later on. So remember these two patterns, you'll hear them a lot. To get us out of this little section, we work down and eventually land on E. Those three low notes we heard at the beginning are now in the banjo, and bring us into the next section, which basically takes the material we heard and plays around with it. Notice how the patterns are almost all the same as we just heard. For clarity, it might be good to break up these two opening parts into chunks of four. The first four bars after the intro introduce the melody, and the four bars following play with it a bit. The rhythms are the same as before, but they're brought to different pitches. After this, we hear the opening measure, not counting the intro, three times in a row, but it's slightly different. The final notes go up a half step each time, and the overall harmony changes. Kirkhope is employing a flat 6 chord. Basically, this takes the 6th chord in a key and lowers the 1st note and 5th note down a half step, essentially borrowing a chord from a key's parallel minor mode.
Here, Kirkhope is just lowering the first note. Using this allows Kirkhope to use the same musical material we've been hearing, but give it a little quirkiness, and still progress the music further. As the melodic material stays mostly static, this part of the melodic idea continues up by step. We finally break out of this static idea to the other main melodic pattern we've heard, and then we get a little coda to end this part. After this, we hear everything we've heard before, but the instrumentation changes. Our stringed banjo gets swapped for a woodwind, some repetitive pitch percussion is added in to provide a little plunkiness that we lost by switching out the banjo, and a sliding trombone is brought in to provide a little bit more quirkiness. Aside from the instrumentation shift, there isn't too much I want to talk about here. I'd actually like to jump to the section after this one, as it changes things up a lot more. A flute takes over the melody. Remember that this instrument represents Banjo's sister Tootie. This section actually kind of balances out those preceding it. It takes the second main melodic idea from the previous two sections, and uses that as the main material. It uses it over and over again, with some trills and straight eighth notes in between. Up until now, this had just been the secondary idea that didn't get as much play. Following this, we get a stripped-down version of the first section, pitched percussion takes on the melody with not much else going on. It then loops back to the very beginning. So really, if we break it down, there are only two main sections. The one with both melodic ideas, which is played with three different instrumentation sets, and the flute section. Now that we've broken this piece down into more manageable segments, I'd like to put it all together again and talk about how it relates to the area and the Banjo-Kazooie soundtrack as a whole. Grant Kirkhope was featured in an installment of Game Grumps, and discussed his composition process for this game. He talked about how he mainly based the soundtrack around the interval of a tritone. A tritone uses one note and the note halfway up or down the octave to make a really dissonant, creepy sound. Kirkhope explained that Banjo and Kazooie are kind of opposites. Banjo is happy and a bit oblivious, while Kazooie is snarky and sharp-witted. So he used the clashy tritone, the two pitch classes furthest from each other in an octave span, to represent their relationship and highlight their differences in a musical way. Let's take a listen to a quick clip so you can hear how Kirkhope uses tritones. This is far from the only example though. But Kirkhope really didn't use that many tritones in the Spiral Mountain theme at all. And it makes sense. This is home for most of our main characters. The music shouldn't draw attention to their differences, because despite them, this is the place they all call home. 
but Kirkhope still needed to give this track some quirkiness to have it fit in with the soundtrack as a whole. The other quirky elements I've talked about add up to provide an alternative quirk to the tritones. The instrumentation is one factor, especially the sliding trombone, which is often associated with goofy old cartoon soundtracks, and the combination of instruments like the super low rumbly tuba with the plucky and bright banjo. Clashy intervals besides the tritone are also utilized for quirkiness. The minor seconds used as neighbor tones clash with the overall harmony, but very quickly so that they don't cause the same dissonant effect used in other tracks. The flat 6 being used as a sort of long-term neighbor tone sequence reinforces this. So while it doesn't emphasize the tritones that Kirkhope had said form the basis of the soundtrack, it doesn't feel out of place at all. In fact, specifically because it avoids the tritone, the Spiral Mountain theme serves the setting very well. Before we move on to the comparison section, it's important that we go over one more variation of this tune. I mentioned before that if the player goes underwater, a slightly different version of this music is played. This one is the most stripped down of all. It's just a marimba with a cool stereo delay effect that makes you feel underwater. As you can't hear as well when you're underwater, the stripped down nature makes sense, and the delay gives it a kind of bubbly feel. Also of note is the accompaniment figure. The melodic material is exactly as we've heard it before, except played by a marimba. The lower material supporting it is actually a variation of what is called Alberti bass accompaniment. So, quick history lesson. Domenico Alberti was a composer from the classical era. Though he wasn't the only one to do this, he often used a melody accompaniment style like this. It's basically a chord broken up into this configuration. The first and third notes are different, and the second and fourth notes are the same. Alberti used it so often that they went ahead and named it after him. So the figure used in this underwater section of Spiral Mountain almost uses a traditional Alberti accompaniment pattern. But the last note goes up further instead of staying the same as the second note. So actually, the last note and the first note are the same, just an octave apart. This will be important in the comparison section. Spiral Mountain in Banjo-Tooie is a lot more depressing. At the beginning of that game, Grunty's two sisters set her free, Grunty destroys Banjo's home, and lovable side character Bottles is killed. Not the happiest way to start a game. Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie use the same tune for Spiral Mountain, but for Banjo-Tooie, it's put into minor mode, and made into sort of a dirge. Dirges are basically pieces of music used for grieving or lamenting. They're most often slow, static, and pretty tragic sounding. Funeral marches are also dirges. Here are a few of the most famous ones. So with all of the tragedy at the beginning of the game, it makes sense to use music like this. But since we know about the happy form of the tune, how does Kirkhope flip that on its head and make it sound so mournful? Well, as mentioned before, it's in minor mode this time around, so that alone gives it a tinge of sorrow. But when we compare it to the funeral marches we just heard, it shares a few other traits with them. The harmonies are static, repetitive, and when they change, it's often a very small change, and like in the orchestral excerpts, you can hear that repetitive low percussion. Its quick attack and following reverberation really paints a picture of barren land and overall emptiness. 
and comparing it back to the Banjo-Kazooie arrangement, remember how I said that arrangement's clashes were mainly from quick neighboring tones, so the clashes themselves didn't last long at all? Well, in Banjo-Tooie, when we get to about a minute in, you'll hear this. Ah, you hear that synth in the background? It's oscillating so widely and it lasts for so long that dissonance is just ever-present. And the lower material is just plucky and doesn't last long, so there's nothing to really ground you. It's just piercing, annoying, depressing sound. Banjo-Tooie also features an underwater version of this theme, and it's pretty similar to the one from the original game, albeit in minor. But there's another subtle difference I want to draw your attention to. Remember before when we talked about Alberti accompaniment? Well here, it's not an altered version of that accompaniment pattern. It's just the original Alberti bass. Why does this matter? Well that means it doesn't go as far up at the end of the pattern as the original did. The original's pattern had the first note and the last note being an octave apart. Here, they're just a fifth apart, like it just can't reach the height that it used to have, back when things were happy. It's tiny subtleties like that adding up that make the contrast between the two games' variations as stark as it is. In Tui, there's also a version of the theme for when you go behind Spiral Mountain's waterfall. This retains the pitched percussion of the underwater version, but with a farty sounding bass line. I'm sorry, I try to be a little more professional in these analyses, but that's just the best way I can describe it. So you get that land and water combo, but it's still depressing. <laughs> So, in these two main Banjo-Kazooie games, Kirkhope shows us just how much one can spin a catchy tune to better fit multiple settings. Ubenaka. For many gamers, one of the most engaging parts of the Banjo-Kazooie games is the morphing music. It can make players feel like they play a large role in the game, even if it's not a role-playing game. What they do affects factors beyond beating enemies, collecting collectibles, and learning new skills. The game adapts to them, immersing them further into the world than they would be otherwise. One of the most exciting parts of the Banjo-Kazooie downloadable content for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate for many fans was that Kirkhope was returning to make yet another version of the Spiral Mountain theme. So many years later and fans were hyped up for yet another variation. That just goes to show how effective Kirkhope's repurposing is. So that's it for this one. I thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Take care. <laughs>